sun's coming out. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Cosm Podcast. On today's episode, I interview Hannah Yatta. Hannah is a surrealist painter whose work plays with the forms of nature and the feminine, interweaving symbols of the unconscious with the struggle of the natural environment. Please welcome Hannah Yatta. So I'm here with Hannah Yada. Hannah, how are you doing? So good to have you on the Cosm Podcast. Yeah, thank you. To start this interview, I just wanted to begin with hearing your origin story. Uh, when did you first uh, get into creating art? And, and tell us a little bit about your path as an artist. Um, sure. <laughs> uh, I think some people know that I grew up as a Jehovah's Witness, and so... Um, for a while, we were homeschooled, and um, we didn't, we weren't able to watch television and all those things growing up. So, you know, one of the things that my dad did, which kudos to him, is like he wanted us to kind of develop things or just, you know, play around, read, um, and he gave us a lot of art supplies growing up. So. I kind of figured out early on that I loved painting and, you know, um, basically a lot of the things that I painted were like animals, um, melting landscapes. <laughs> and um, So uh, early on when you kind of were doodling as a kid, um, you, did you see certain patterns in your interests that still exist now? Yeah, like I was in love with these stories of animals. Um, I don't know if you know, heard of the writer Brian Jacques. He mm -hmm. like all these, yeah, he wrote like the Redwall books. And so I don't know, like I just love seeing the chipmunks because we grew up um, in the woods and I was always just kind of doodling those things. But I guess I always kind of wanted to like um, illustrate something more. So a lot of it was like these these crazy colors and like melting flowers and stuff. Like mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Nice. So uh, when you, by the time you went to college, did you know that being an artist was a path you wanted to pursue? No, I always thought that, you know, that was something that, that wasn't like a legitimate job, you know, mm -hmm. especially as a Jehovah's Witness growing up, they were always like, oh, you need to find something um, that's going to make you money and just support yourself, like worshiping God, you know, <laughs> and an artist is definitely not one of those things. So. Depends on who you ask, <laughs> you, know, you know, sometimes painting is a way of worshiping God. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, cool. So, so then you kind of broke out of that and, uh, pursued painting more seriously. And did you go to art school? How did you pursue art? Uh, in terms of your education? Yeah, um, I, well, I didn't actually go to an art school. Um, in Georgia, they have this thing called the Hope Scholarship. So basically, I could go to any state university. And I mean, as long as I had really good grades, it was pretty much paid for. So, you know, I went to, um, you know, or graduated from the University of Georgia. And it was, you know, the art program is funny. Like it was good in the terms of like, it gave you the, the time to explore yourself, but I wasn't, I didn't feel like I was taught technically the way I wanted to be, you know, like I wanted to really develop craft and um, I had something that I wanted to express. I just didn't have the talent yet. Um, but yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, let's talk more about the kind of things you express in your art. Um, so the characters in your art, they're so beautiful. You depict these half-human, half-animal hybrids, which are technically called therianthropes. Uh, this is a form that has been represented in art throughout human history, from prehistoric cave paintings to Egyptian gods like Anubis, Horus, and Toth. 
What for you is the symbolic power that lies in representing the half human, half animal form? I think it's, uh, I think it's something to do with ritual. Like when you have like a half human, half animal form, especially with the, the animal head, you, there's something very ritualistic kind of spiritual mysterious about it. Um, it always seems that these kind of animal headed forms are somehow like holding a path to higher knowledge, something like that. Um, that they have something that, that we as humans relate to in terms of like having the human body, but then they also have the, the animal or the mask. Um, and it's an interesting thing because, I mean, I don't know about you, but I've always felt that as humans, I've always felt a little bit not part of nature in a way. Like we, we seem so different. And I think combining those two things, it's like combining the otherworldly with the natural world. And we're able to like be initiated into both realms. Mm -hmm. The figures that you portray, they're often like flexed and contorted in the fetal position or hunched over, which gives the sense of struggle and vulnerability. Uh, in Oraculum, the piece right behind you, uh, there's a sense that your characters are breaking up and out of something as if there's a struggle for ascension to move from a lower place to a higher place. Uh, can you speak a bit about the, int the intentionality behind the body language of your characters? Sure, yeah. I mean, yeah, kind of going through and, and looking at sort of the pattern of repetition, as you mentioned, the like, kind of fetal positions, kind of hunched over. They're very like creaturely. And, mm. you know, um, there, there tends to be this like uh, idea that, you know, when, when the, the figure is kind of like um, shown throughout like art history, it's usually by the the male gaze that you see the figures and it's like usually like there's kind of this this showing of the the female form for you know the male gaze um mine is kind of i see my psychology as kind of like feeling the body and the way like we relate to it is kind of you know you kind of feel it as you hunch over mm -hmm. um and it's it's not it's a it's a more like relaxed sometimes pose but also like there's a lot of, you know, energy motion kind of coming through the characters, but they're not, they're not in a way that's, I wouldn't say pretty most of the time, you know, mm -hmm. um, they're kind of like evolving, they're doing something. Um, and should I talk, do you want to talk about Oraculum? <laughs> yeah, let's do it. Yeah, I think that one is like a special piece because as you mentioned, it's like, it's it's kind of like opening up the body. Mm -hmm. it's, it's trying to transcend. And this was like, you know, conceptually a very new piece for me because it was like, you know, you have like these snakes, which are like these symbols of the earth mother and of like, you know, oracles and water and the womb and you know like this is it like the snakes like dragging her down or lifting her up and mm. I've always felt psychologically there's there's this struggle of the human mind or at least my mind that we try to transcend things because we know too consciously that we're gonna die and um, I feel like you know many times religion is a way to to kind of get over that that's um fear of death mm -hmm. and this to me was like the the kind of need for transcendence but this also like um dancing in the mire of you know existence <laughs> reality of matter mm -hmm. wow yeah so did you feel in the religion that you grew up in 
uh, being a Jehovah's Witness, was there kind of a strong sense of that religion being used for death denial? Did you feel like there were certain things you were kind of being taught not to look at? Like death? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's always like either, you know, there's a certain number of people that will go to heaven or you will live forever in a paradise on earth. Mm. Um, and of course, that is like a huge, like, I was taught that, that, that Armageddon would come before I was like 20, basically. So, <laughs> you know, yeah. um, I left when I was 15 and I was, I was terrified for like, you know, about a decade after I left that, you know, anytime like the, I saw like a, a blood red sunset or something that that was like the end, and, you know, I was going to mm-hmm. be destroyed by God. <laughs> so, you know, it, it, it was like kind of studying about that fear of death and, and coming to terms with it because I never thought I was going to die. I think, you know, like mm-hmm. when you're brainwashed from such an early age, it, it really gets into your psyche somehow. So, um, mm-hmm. I guess wow. not good, but <laughs> yeah. Well, what, uh, what if any, uh, other religious mythologies have influenced you, uh, and your art? Um, I think like lately as I've kind of come to terms more with like my Japanese background and, um, studying, uh, bit about Shintoism it's not, I guess it's not like it's technically not a religion <laughs> mm-hmm. it's more of like this way of life that they revere nature um but it, it's not like a supposedly this religious code that you have to do it or you know it, it's for like some sort of afterlife it's more of just like this intuitive feeling that um there is this spirit that there's this life force in nature and especially like certain things, rocks, trees, waterfalls, um, that I find incredibly beautiful, you know, just freeing in its own. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, um, I really love all of your art, uh, does a really good job at appreciating the beauty of nature. Um, but in a very bizarre way, particularly <laughs> referring to some of your uh, ecstatic imaginative beasts like Sublime Madness or the Opulence of Memory. Uh, but it is a type of bizarre that seems to showcase the beauty of nature as opposed to repelling us in disgust. Can you talk about why you use bizarre surrealism to showcase the beauty of nature and why it works so well? Sure. Um, I guess those are like a kind of different pieces for me. I know that they're both very psychedelic, but <laughs> yeah, I always kind of like separate my my uh, paintings a little bit from like when I lived in the city from like where I live now. You know, um, I think living in New York City, it's like you're constantly surrounded by the smell of trash and <laughs> people and. <laughs> mm-hmm dirty streets, I guess. Um, and yeah, like, I guess it, it's, it's one of those things that uh, sublime madness is, is kind of like this ecstatic, but inspired like the, the Francis Bacon furies of these like kind of weird globular white monsters that are like mm. trying to, um, get themselves out of this or, or kind of rise above the situation. They're like furious. Um, and the opulence of memory is, is kind of more of this like spiritual piece about this idea of memory and elephants and wondering about like um, genetic memory and, and, and wondering about like, how much we inherit from, you know, our families, um, and how much animals (laughs) do the same thing. Mm -hmm. Uh, but I guess, you know, it's like, yeah, it's, it's, it's just trying to capture this state of, of ecstasy of like, um, 
sublime, you know, the, the feeling that you get from seeing nature. Like I, it, it's, it's this wild, untamable force to me. Mm -hmm. Um, and expressing that in, in different creatures is an interesting thing. Cause I think, uh, you know, it's always been kind of best described in the dragon form, I guess, uh, this kind of sonic earth mother, you know, wild, um, serpent slash winged animals slash <laughs> you know this this very powerful force and I think doing those very crazy little animals is just kind of like trying to experiment with that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. So the inspiration for these beings that you create uh, does it ever come from your visions or a dream uh, or do you construct them on the canvas uh, throughout your process? Um, yeah, it's funny because I think my dreams are pretty boring and my <laughs> <laughs> waking like inspirations are the most colorful ones. <laughs> yeah, wow. So you're making up for the lack of dream life on the canvas. <laughs> exactly. It's funny. It's, it's one of those things that uh, I feel like you you kind of go to a certain place or you hear um music and to me like the inspirations for these paintings tend to, to kind of pop up from there and then it, then it's kind of up to me to kind of work it out on the canvas and mm. that can be a very arduous painful process but it's it's um it's like i just don't stop until it feels right mm -hmm. um have you ever been visited by a creature that you've created in your dreams? No. No. <laughs> huh. That would be amazing. I think it'd be so cool if you like created this whole being and this whole kind of personified character and then it spoke to you in some way. Um, but perhaps it just does throughout your process of creating it. Yeah, I think it's it I think I have too much of a relationship with it that my brain needs rest. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, of course. Well, so it's clear that you are using your art to explore uh symbolic subject matter. Um that you are using your art as a way of wrestling with particular philosophy uh as opposed to just making something that looks good. Uh, when did you begin to apply the kind of symbolism that you have into your art? I guess it started, uh, I mean, it, it's, it's, it's evolved from when I first seriously kind of started with uh, my subject matter. Like you start to, you find your own language, um, but I start to see like, how my subconscious was, you know, kind of pushing me towards certain things and, you know, continuing to read and study about like the symbolism. Um, I was able to say, use those in more conscious ways than, you know, um, how I was using it before. Mm -hmm. the, I want to talk a little bit more about the presence of nature in your work. Like, what are some geographical places of nature that have inspired your work? Um, yeah, like, my dad is kind of a travel freak. <laughs> um, and so he, he took us around the country when we were little. And, you know, we, we went to, like, um, well, we um, basically camped across the United States to uh, California to the sequoias we also did the same thing to montana um we went to costa rica um i think you know as i've gotten older i've like actually appreciated those experiences more and you know we i did go with my husband to the amazon jungle a few years ago and that was one of the most incredibly like magical moments you know i think that that really like 
did something to me. It, it, it really got inside my brain. Um, that, and then I go to Japan almost every year to see my dad and he takes this all around the countryside and, you know, it's, it's basically a jungle out there as well. It's mm -hmm. incredible. Um, Do you have a favorite animal? Definitely my rabbits. I'm sorry. Oh, oh, oh nice. <laughs> How many rabbits do you have? Five. <laughs> you have five rabbits. That's amazing. That's why there's so many rabbits in your in your art. <laughs> they they just yeah they they're hilarious. <laughs> Good little figure models. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Awesome. Uh, well, Hannah, I think that's a good place to wrap it up. Um, yeah, thank you. Thank you so much for coming on the Cosm podcast. It was so amazing to talk with you. Oh, thank you. <laughs> thank you for inviting me. Thank you again for listening to the Cosm podcast. To stay updated on any future podcasts or virtual events, please be sure to follow Chapel of Sacred Mirrors on Instagram and Facebook and to subscribe on all major platforms. To learn more about Hannah Yatta, you can go to hannayatta.com. And thank you to everyone who has donated during this time. Every donation is a stand for the future of Cosm and allows us to continue to bring inspiring and uplifting content like this to our community. And thank you to DECA for the soundtrack to this podcast. You can find DECA on YouTube, Spotify, and Bandcamp. Mm -hmm.